chapter 6 today. It's almost three different contexts. It's going to be dealing with problems about Jesus and the leaders on the Sabbath, and then moving right into Luke's rendition of the Sermon on the Mount, which in Luke is the Sermon on the Plain. Now, beginning in verse 1, we have a mention of the Sabbath, and again in verse 6. One of two things is true here. Jesus is healing every day of the week, and the gospel authors are picking up on the Sabbath because of its theological connotations with rabbinical Judaism are. Jesus is intentionally causing confrontation with the Jewish leaders on the Sabbath. Now, when I look at it, it seems like he's causing confrontation. But that seems so out of character with him. I bet he did this every day of the week and did not simply stop because it was the Sabbath. And the gospel writers just pick up on the conflict to prove who he is. Now, I want to say again about these Pharisees and their scribes. Ladies and gentlemen, these were very sincere people, very committed people. They wanted with all of their heart, mind, and strength to do the will of God. They wanted to keep the Torah of Moses. And they had defined that in such a way that every, every detail of life was put in a category that they could know they were keeping the law. When God said, don't work on the Sabbath, the day of rest, they want to know what work was. And so the oral tradition defined what work was. And that's what Jesus seemed to attack is this oral tradition. Now the problem was not the commitment, not the knowledge. It was the attitude of these men where rules became more important than people and ceremonial details became more significant than a heart of faith toward God. I think some of us are in that category of religiosity and not love. And this chapter is certainly going to talk about that. One Sabbath, he happened passing through a wheat fields, and his disciples were pulling and eating the heads of the wheat, rubbing them in their hands. Now notice that his actions on the Sabbath had influenced his disciples where they felt more comfortable in doing things that normally they would have never done on the Sabbath. Now, it was legal for people passing down the road to pick some of the fruit or grain and eat it for their need. They couldn't carry it away, but they could eat it for their immediate need. That's Deuteronomy 23:25. But the problem was they were breaking three or four Sabbath laws. First, by pulling the grain, they were reaping. And by eating the heads, they were preparing it by rubbing it in their hand. By rubbing it, they were threshing and willowing. And so all of these regulations came into play. They were violating. And I'm sure they knew that. Now, it says the Pharisees said, Why are you doing what is against the law to do on the Sabbath? And Jesus enters a discussion that is so significant in relation to who he understood himself to be. This is the passage that said, And Jesus answered them, Did you never read what David did when his soldiers became hungry? This is a direct reference to 1 Samuel 21, 1 through 6. It talks about the showbread. Now these were 12 loaves, one for every tribe, put in the holy prey on the table of showbread, which was uh, when it was catty-cornered to the, the veil in front of the Holy of Holies. Every week the priest would take those off and the priest would eat them. Now these weren't no Mrs. Baird loaves. They were six and a quarter pounds of flour bread. That is some, a big loaf of bread, six and a quarter pounds. David was hungry. The, pe the priest let his soldiers eat this bread. Now, notice where it says, against the law for anyone except the priest. Now this is Leviticus 24, 5 through 9. Um, Verse 5, and he said to them, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Now, of course, the Son of Man is Jesus' self-chosen title. I think it comes from Daniel 7, 13, where it implies humanity and deity. The word Lord here is used in the connotation of master or owner. Now, Jesus claiming to be master of the Sabbath, which was given by God as a command in Exodus 28 through 11, says that he is deity and can control the... Uh, commands of deity. So it's a strong messianic implication. And I think we need to see that. Now beginning in verse 6 is another account on the Sabbath. Whether the same Sabbath or another Sabbath is uncertain from the text. It's the healing of a man with a withered right hand. It's recorded in Mark 3, 1 through 6, Matthew 12, 9 through 14. Only Luke mentions it's the right hand because that would have impaired his vocation unless he was left-handed, but he, of course, probably was not. Notice it says the Pharisees in verse 7 were the scribes and Pharisees. The scribes were the official teachers of the law 
interpreters of the law, and the Pharisees were a particular party. Most scribes were Pharisees, but the two are not synonymous. Now, when it mentions here about they were closely watching him, this is an imperfect middle tense, which they themselves over and over watching him to charge him in this area. And Jesus saw this man, uh, in the, he was in the synagogue on the Sabbath, and he knew uh, that they were thinking of these things, and he said to the man with the withered hand, the paralyzed hand, the shrunken hand, muscular atrophy had occurred, get up and stand in front. This is an aorist imperative. Notice the man did not ask to be healed. Jesus is using him as an object lesson. And he looked at the people around there and he says, is it right on the Sabbath to do good to people or to do them evil, to save life or to take it? Now they were planning on killing him and they're going to kill him and they're planning to do it on the Sabbath because, because he is breaking their little laws, not because he's helping people because he's breaking their laws. And he looked around, and verse 10 says, Then he glanced around at all of them. Now, Mark adds in anger, but it doesn't say here. Put your hand out. Aorist imperative. The man did. He was healed. Uh, look at verse 11. But they were filled with fury. This is the word for mine with the alpha privative. They were out of their minds in fury. And they began to discuss what they would do to Jesus. You might want to see uh, Mark 3, 6. The rabbis did allow if a man's life was in danger that they, you could do something, but not anything less than that. Now, this, this next section deals with the calling of the twelve. Verse 12 through 16. Uh, I have a graphic I'd like to show you that deals with the disciples. There are four basic lists in the New Testament of the disciples of Jesus. The first one is found in Matthew 10, 2 through 4. Mark 3, 16 through 19, Luke 6, 12 through 16, and finally Acts 1, 13. There are three groups of four that remain constant, though the order of the names within those three groups varies. Peter always appears first, and Judas Iscariot always appears last. Now, of course, Peter is the name for Simon. It means a detached rock. And we have, by the way, we have the term Notice he went up on the mountain to pray all night. It's a low rolling hills, if you please, not mountain like we would think. He prayed all night. I want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, if Jesus Christ, God's Son incarnate, needed to pray all night about what he was going to do, don't you know we need to pray more? He prayed all night in the choosing of the twelve. Now, twelve, I think, because it symbolized the twelve tribes of Israel. It's a number used for administration in the Bible. I also believe when it says the word apostles here, that is from the verb to send, apostello. And um, it originally in classical Greek meant to send as an ambassador. So it meant to send one as a representative of another's authority. And, of course, that's what they were for Jesus. Then we have Simon, who is named Peter. And they're all listed here. By the way, Bartholomew is other lists called Nathaniel. And uh, notice where it says Judas, the son of James. He's often called Thaddeus. And then we have Judas Iscariot. Now, Iscariot is either from the town Curioth in Judah, which means he's the only non-Galean, or it may be from the word for the assassin's knife that the zealots carried uh, in their fight against the Romans. We're not sure which it is. Most traditional is Curioth, a town in Judah. In verses 17 through 19, then, is the beginning of the introduction to the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, in Matthew, it's called the Sermon on the Mount. In Luke, it's called the Sermon on the Plain. I think Jesus went from a higher place to a, a lower level place, but still on the side of the hill, close to the Sea of Galilee. Uh, Matthew and it has a real long passage on this. I have one more graphic I'd like to show you quickly to show the relationship between the Sermon on the Plain in Luke 6 and the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 through 7. Have you noticed that Matthew is, of course, the longer passage. It's 101 verses all the way from chapter 5 through chapter 7. Luke only has 29. But Luke includes some things that Matthew doesn't. The little cursing section in 6, 26 through 28 is only in Luke. Um, this seems to be the ordination sermon for the apostles or their, the giving of the kingdom ethic. Basically, this sermon does not deal with specific commands, but with an attitude toward our world and the disciples' place in it. And that's very important you see that because we don't have Romans who make us go one mile and carry the pack. We can't reduplicate the emphasis of these culturally conditioned commands, but the universal principle of our ethic, our attitude, our, our surrender of ourself to Christ in every area of our life is what's dealt with here. And I think that's very, very significant. Now, notice it says, Blessed are you who are poor. Now, Matthew, 
It says poor in spirit. And several times through here, Matthew will add a spiritual quality. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Luke is more focusing in on the social conditions that disciples will find themselves in. And Matthew is focusing in on the spiritual conditions reflecting those social conditions. Now, I think Matthew is the fuller. I believe the Beatitudes are a stair step of a spiritual attitude about ourselves and our world that issues in a committed discipleship. And Luke seems a bit more social than that. Now, the term kingdom of God. In Matthew, it's the term kingdom of heaven. I believe those are synonymous phrases. Matthew, writing to Jews, uses a circumlocation for God. Doesn't like to use the name God, so he uses heaven, kingdom of heaven. Now, if you'll look at uh, Mark 1.15 and Matthew 4.17, you will see that these are synonymous in every way. And we must remember that. Now, notice it says the kingdom of God is yours, not shall be yours, a current possession. Then it says, blessed are you who are hungry, Matthew has, for righteousness, but you will be completely satisfied. This word used for this uh, stuffing of animals, the gorging of animals, okay? Um, let's see. Blessed are you who weep now. This seems to be, if it's true, that Matthew is the fuller account. This means weeping over personal sin and our spiritual bankruptcy. It may be an idea of weeping over the evilness of the world. For you will laugh. Blessed are you when people exclude you. This may be excluding from the synagogue or being socially ostracized. We're not sure which. And denounce you and spurn your name as evil for the sake of the Son of Man. Now, this doesn't mean that we get caught cheating in taxes or we get caught robbing our neighbor or we get caught in adultery and people say things bad about us. This is the idea that only because we're followers of Jesus are these things said about us. This is because we're Christians, not because we're evil people. Verse 23. Burst into joy on that day. On what day? Either the day of persecution, I see what it means. And leap for ecstasy. You might well see Matthew 5, 10 through 12. For your reward will be rich in heaven. I believe there will be a reward in heaven. I believe the relationship is this. I believe we're going to make heaven because of God's grace through our faith response. But I believe once we get there, we're going to be adorned and equipped to fully enjoy it, how we've yielded to God's will for our lives and to our spiritual gift. There is a sense where everything, every area that God deals with man is his initiative by grace. But he has chosen that man must respond, and man's response will make a difference in how much we're able to enjoy heaven. Now, notice if you would where it says, for this is the way your forefathers used to treat the prophets. Now look down in verse 26. The same phrase is used about the false prophets. There is a pattern being set here. When we speak the truth and even God's people reject us, when, we, when the false prophet speaks the truth and they're acclaimed not only by the world but by the church, we recognize a pattern in the Old Testament. God people keep saying, I want to hear God's word, and yet when they hear it, they usually kill the prophet. Now after he's dead, they build a great monument to him. But the truth is, we really don't want to hear God's word. We like our own self-oriented life. And that's the truth. It's not pleasant. It's just the truth. Now, in verse 24, 25, and 26 is the cursing section that's unique to Luke. Now, the word curse means primarily woe or alas. It doesn't mean uh, active evil come upon you, but, but, but uh, sad are you, uh, 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 hurt are you. That's the idea. If, if uh, you are rich. Now, rich, the problem with riches is never money or wealth itself. That has never been a problem in the Bible. The Bible does not condemn wealth. But what it does condemn is the, the illusion of self-sufficiency that wealth brings to human beings and also the this world orientation that it forces upon those who have to worry about their riches. And that's the problem here. Uh, those who have wealth always support the status quo. You ever notice that? Now, uh, for you are now receiving, this term means paid in full, it's an accounting term, your comforts in full. A curse on you who live in luxury now, for you will be hungry. It's almost like the, the parable of Lazarus and the rich man, isn't it? A curse on you who laugh now. That I can't mean be taken literally, because right back up here in verse 21 it said you will laugh. This means a superficial merriment at others' expense, a focusing on this world and its conditions. Okay, I think that's what it's talking about. For you will mourn and weep. A curse when you, when everyone speaks well of you, for this is the way their forefathers used to treat the false prophets. I want to say to you that uh, quite often the uh, ones who have been very successful in the church have not always been the ones who spoke for God. We need to remember that. Now, in verses 27 through 36 is a comparison 
between the superiority of the new covenant over Moses' covenant. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, the new covenant is, is uh, characterized by self-giving, sacrificial love. The old covenant was characterized by rules that focus on practical aspects of life. Example, in Leviticus 18, excuse me, 19, verse 18 and 34, it says, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But Jesus radically intensifies that when he says, I say you shall love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. Now the exact same thing is done in Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 and following, where in verses 21 and later I think in 29, Jesus takes the Old Testament law and intensifies the attitude behind it. It's not just adultery that's the problem, it's lust. And it's not just murder that's the problem, it's hate. And it's not just love that's the issue. It's self-giving love even for our enemies. And you see the radical difference? The kingdom ethic is a, a entirely superior ethic to the ethic of Moses. Now, the one is preparatory to the other. I'm not saying yes and no. I'm saying one has built on the other. Now, when we get into this, notice in verse 27 where it says, And I say to you who listen now to me, practice loving your enemies. Now the word love here is the word agape. Now, there are several words in Greek. There's the word eros, which means sexual love. We get erotic from that. There's the word storge. We get family love from that. There's the word phileo, Philadelphia. We get brotherly love for that. But a word that was not used very often in classical Greek and was redefined by the church is the term agape. It's used to describe God's love for man in John 3.16. It's used to describe Christ's love for man by dying on the cross. And so it's a word that speaks of God's kind of self-giving, no strings attached love. It is my personal conviction that agape in the Greek New Testament is synonymous with hesed in the Hebrew Old Testament, which means God's covenant unconditional loyalty. And I think that's so important for us to hear. Now, notice where it says, but I say to you, to you who listen to me, practice loving your enemies. And now there are four examples given here in the context. And here are the four examples. Practice doing good to those who hate you. Not just refrain from bad attitude, active, positive, good. For you see, the truth of the matter is, love is not an emotion, it's an action. Love is not a, an emotion, it is an action. Boy, if you can catch that, you've caught a whole lot from this lesson. Now, so do good, not just hate. Look at the next one. Continue to bless those who curse you and continue to pray for those who abuse you. Well, that's what the good means here. What is the good we do to our enemies? We pray for them. We speak well of them. We love them. Here's the second one. If a man strikes you on the cheek, offer your other. Now, this is not like the, the slave that slapped Jesus in the face uh, when he was before. This is like someone with a fist who hits you in the jaw to, to violently attack you. Now, what this is saying is that most of the time when someone physically attacks us, our first impulse is to break their head. It's a violent reaction. But Jesus' way is, no, we're going to do far more. We're going to do far more by love than we ever would with retaliation. Notice if you would where it says, and from the man who takes away your coat, do not keep back your shirt either. Now we got to go back to Palestine where, where people wore an outer cloak in which they slept in like a sleeping bag and inner underwear. We would think of it underwear if they would call it an undergarment. Now this is obviously can't be taken literally because they had a lot of nude people running around Jerusalem and that was just a no-no for what it means here is, go the second mile, if I can say that. If someone asks you for help, you help them beyond what they ask. It is the idea that love overflows the request. It goes beyond what's expected of it. It goes beyond what humans think is appropriate. And by the very nature of going beyond, or the very nature of acting in a certain way where others would act a different way, the strange otherworldness beauty of Christian love comes out and only comes out in that case. And here's the, the next one. Practice giving to everyone who asks of you and stop demanding back your goods from him who takes them away. This is a present imperative with a May article, stop and act in process. Some think this has to do with lending money for interest. I would say that the Jews were not allowed to lend fellow Jews at interest. I think we're so caught up in a modern world where we live in a system of credit that we don't feel like it's inappropriate now to charge folks interest. But I want to say to you, the exorbitant interest rates and the structure of American capitalism in 
in all aspects is against the poor and it is biased against the poor. And I want to say to all Christians that it's inappropriate for the rich to exploit the poor in any area and then claim to follow God's will for their life. I don't care if it's a, a banking system that charges interest or a landowners in a ghetto. We are as caught up in abusing the poor as any generation and any culture that's ever lived and we're claiming all the time to be so Christian about it. I think God throws up over our capitalistic greed. Now, notice you would in verse 31. By the way, I want to mention that verses 29 and 30 describe in, in beautiful terms an attitude of submission to others. And of course, the universal principle of that is found in Ephesians 5, 21. Now, beginning in, in verse 31, Yes, you must practice dealing with others as you would have them deal with you. And look down at verse 35. You must practice loving your enemies and doing good to them and lending to them and despairing for nothing. Now here is a, a wide principle put out. And this principle is that love must deal with others as love would like to be dealt with. Now, I think it's important here that we need to have a good self-image and a good self-love to, to apply this. Uh, there's such poor self-image today that I don't want you loving me like you love yourself because most people do not love themselves but abuse themselves. No, this is a proper attitude toward ourselves that comes because we understand God's love for us. If God's love for us, then we can love others as God has loved us. And there's the, there's the flow. Now in verse 32 down through 35 it is a series of of. Um, of Things are connected with how do we do this? How do we love our enemies? You see the if in verse 32, the if in verse 33, the if in verse 34? Well, those are specific examples. Now, they are culturally conditioned. I mean, they apply mostly to first century Judaism with a Roman occupation force. So in the, in the margin of my Bible, I've written four things that I think might apply to our culture. Love those who drive inappropriately in front of you. Number two, pauses without looking primarily at the tax break. Three, love and respect others, even those of other denominations that are growing faster than your own. Four, pick up your neighbor's trash that has blown into your yard. Love is an unusual action that shines in a world and is unique in itself because it's so different what the majority that know not our Christ do. Notice if you would, uh, in verse the latter part of verse 35, so your reward will be great and you'll be the sons of the Most High. Now I want to say to you that we ought to be characteristics of God. Our lives ought to reflect not who we are, but who He is. Our lives are crucial in determining whether we're sons of, sons of the evil one. Now in verses 37 through 38, we have the section that deals with criticizing. This would be parallel to Matthew chapter 7. We do have to make judgments about people. We do have to decide who's going to be leaders in the church. We do have to make uh, certain uh, judgments related to who's going to lead people in this and that area. But we are never to judge people with an attitude of superiority or something like, well, that's just inappropriate. Friends, if anybody is going to be judged for being inappropriate, all of us lay prostrate before the Lord in that. Stop criticizing, present imperative with the May article. They were criticizing. This word judge or criticizing is the word crino. We get the word critic and criticism from it in English. Then it says, you'll, and you'll never be criticized, a strong double negative. Now here's the second parallel. Stop condemning, another present imperative with the May article, and you'll never be condemned, strong double negative. Notice it says, verse 38, practice forgiving others and you'll be forgiven. I want to tell you some of the strongest words that we have never dealt with seriously in the church deal with forgiving. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to read again chapter 6, verses 14 and 15, where after the large prayer, Jesus said, if you're not willing to forgive others, your heavenly Father will not forgive you. And if that's not enough, look at chapter 18, verse 35. I want to tell you some of the strongest words I've ever heard deal with our forgiving others. Now, we're not right with God because we forgive others. But because we're right with God, we ought to forgive others. And to not forgive others shows there's a problem in our understanding of God's love for us. Now, um, this latter part of verse 38, I've put, this is the positive maxim of what we commonly say, if you live by the sword, you'll die by the sword. That's the negative axiom. 
This is the positive axiom. If you do good to others, you'll have good done unto you. And that's basically what this is talking about here. And it's not just good. It's going to be overflowing, undeserved. Friends, I don't want justice. I want undeserved. <laughs> Deliver me from what's due me. Now, and the, what follows, a little story in verse 39 and 40, that really I don't know how it fits in here, it, unless they're talking about the, the, the leaders that people are trying to follow. It's about the speck in your brother's eye. I think Jesus must have said this with a smile on his face. This is just what it's in Matthew 7, 2 and 3. It's the guy with the big old log sticking out of his eye, trying to help his brother get the little bitty speck out. Well, doesn't that just describe us all too often? Most of us pick a few little rules that we don't happen to do, and then we judge everybody else by the few little things we don't do. Now, isn't that the religious pits? That's exactly the problem of the Pharisees. Now, the word hypocrite is used there in verse 42. The word hypocrite is a theatrical term that means to judge under or to play act. And that's, of course, what we're doing when we play that religious game. Now, in verse 43 is the idea about the healthy tree. If we could take that back to Matthew 7, 16 and 20, it's talking about by their fruits ye shall know them. That's true of all religious people, all religious groups. By their fruits. What they say and how they live are integrally, organically linked and cannot be separated. That's the idea here. When it says, for every tree is known, this is the, the little word epigonosco, which intensifies the word no to full and experiential knowledge. Beware of false teachers, what they're talking about. They come in sheep's clothing, but you can catch them by their fruits. And their fruits mean their attitude, their lifestyle, as well as their theology. Now, then verse 46 now and following is a, is a little famous little passage for me. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, but do not practice what I tell you? You will see Matthew 7, 21 through 23, where some men were had great preaching services, great exorcisms, great miracles, but they didn't know Jesus. You see, it's more than what we do. It's an attitude of the heart. It's not only lip service, it's an attitude. And so both our lifestyle and our attitude are crucial. And you can read the rest of this. It closes much like the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7 about a man who built his house. One built it on sand, one built it on rock in Matthew. Well, here it's about people digging down the foundation. One didn't dig far enough. He just dig a little bit and built his house. The other dug till he reached bedrock. And, of course, the, the truth here is the bedrock are the teachings of Jesus so different from the world that if we build our lives, our personalities, our families on these eternal truths, our, our, our feet will never slip and our lives will be in the will of God.